Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop, created for people with diabetes by people who have diabetes. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, it's all about books and a TV show that's based on books. We're talking about The Babysitter's Club with a New York Times bestselling author who loved the series as a child and was diagnosed with type 1 as an adult. Oh my gosh, I'm now uh, something that I was a fan of for so long, I can now watch on my wow. television. You know, I wasn't even thinking about Stacy. When I did start to watch it, I thought it was nearly perfect. Robin Benway is the winner of the National Book Award. When we talk about Stacy and The Babysitter's Club, what we liked, what we didn't, and about diabetes in media. Plus, a dad turns his toddler's story into an adorable picture book about type 1. In Tell Me Something Good, she had a huge goal for the JDRF rides this year. Of course, so much had to be canceled and changed, but this woman's story took a wonderful turn on and off the bike. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I'm so glad to have you along. I'm your host, Stacey Sims, and we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection. My son was diagnosed with type 1, gosh, ages ago now. He was almost 2, and in December, it'll be 14 years. Yeah, he's 15 and a half, 15 and more than that. I don't even know anymore. My husband lives with type 2 diabetes. I do not have diabetes, but I have a background in broadcasting, and that is how you get the podcast, which we've been doing now for more than five years. And I have been wanting to talk about the Babysitter's Club for a long time. I mean, we have talked about it because many guests over the years have said that it was very influential to them. Either they read it and really were touched by Stacy's story, the character who lives with the type one, or somebody else read it and diagnosed them because of it. That happened at least once to one of my guests. It's really incredible to think about these books and the impact they've had on our community. So when I saw a column in Elle magazine recently, about the Netflix adaptation, I really wanted to talk to Robin Benway, the author. I knew she'd be fun to talk to just by her writing voice in the magazine, and she really was. And Robin also had some unique insight about the books and about the adaptation, and I was really excited to talk to her. We also talked about diabetes in other media. You know, I think a lot of us cringe when we know there's going to be a depiction of diabetes in a show or, you know, they mention insulin and we, oh, we know what's coming. So it was fun to talk to Robin about that and to kind of spotlight some good stuff that's actually out there. All right, I'm going to talk about my reaction in more depth to Babysitter's Club in a little bit of a review, but I'm going to do that later on because this is a longer episode. We've got two interviews. We've got Robin. And I also spoke to a dad who wrote a picture book, a rhyming kids book for and about his little boy. And it's called Year One with Type One. And that is with Mike Suarez. So that's coming up in just a bit. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop. And I spoke to the people at OneDrop. I was really impressed at how much they get diabetes. It makes sense. Their CEO, Jeff, was diagnosed with type 1 as an adult. OneDrop is for people with diabetes by people with diabetes. The people at OneDrop work relentlessly to remove all barriers between you and the care you need. Get 24-7 coaching support in your app and unlimited supplies delivered. No prescriptions or insurance required. Their beautiful sleek meter fits in perfectly with the rest of your life. They'll also send you test strips with a strip plan that actually makes sense for how much you actually check. One drop, diabetes care delivered. Learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the One Drop logo. My guest this week is a National Book Award winner and a New York Times best-selling author. She wrote a column about the Babysitter's Club and her reaction to it in Elle magazine. That's what caught my eye. I reached out and said, would you talk to us? Would you come on the show? She said, sure. And we had a great conversation. Now, she grew up with a father who lived with type 1 diabetes, but she herself was not diagnosed until she was an adult. So her perspective on the Babysitter's Club, which she loved, as you'll hear, as a kid, it was very different because she wasn't relating to the type one aspect about it right away. I'm also curious to know what you thought of the Babysitter's Club. I'm going to be putting more about this in the Facebook group. We've talked about it a little bit 
but we'll put more posts in there and get your take. And as I said earlier, I'm going to put a little bit more of my review, although you'll, you'll hear much of it in the interview, but a little bit more later on. Here is my talk with Robin Benway. Robin, thank you so much for jumping on to talk about this. I really appreciate it. It's, I'm looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, same here. Thank you so much for having me. All right, before we jump into the Babysitter's Club, and I have a lot to talk about with that, let me ask you just the basics. You were diagnosed as a young adult, right? You were in your in your mid-20s. Yes, I was 26. It was July of, what, 2003 I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed with celiac disease at the same time. I was having really low um, iron problems. I was having anemia. So they started doing a lot of blood work just to find out what was going on and started noticing that I had elevated blood sugar levels. And my father, who is my biological father, was also a type 1 diabetic. So once they saw those blood sugar levels being elevated, they started to put things together pretty quickly. And so I, in a, you know, a very strange way, felt very lucky that I was diagnosed that way, that it didn't progress to the point where I had to be hospitalized or my blood sugars were, you know, four, five, six hundred or something like that, that I was diagnosed sort of accidentally and mm -hmm. was able to catch it pretty early and could start, you know, meeting with an endocrinologist and started taking insulin pretty soon after that. So there was no mistaking at that age. Oh, maybe it's type two. Maybe it's something else because of your father. They pretty much went right there. At first, they were like, maybe it's type two. There was a lot of, I think, you know, this was 17 years ago. So I think now the way that people are diagnosing type one and people in their 20s and 30s is very different than it was 17 years ago. I think that was when people were just starting to see that, at least based on my experience and the responses that I was getting from doctors at the time. You know, I had grown up knowing that my dad was diabetic, but in our family, we had always sort of been under the impression that once you hit 12 or 13 years old, you're sort of out of the woods of that. You know, I think a lot of, they used to call it juvenile diabetes, right, right. you know, because they were diagnosed so young. So I think it was a real shock because I had always thought, okay, I'm out of the woods. I'm fine. And that wasn't the case, but they definitely did think it was type two. Um, they started me on oral medications at first, metformin, but nothing worked. And I remember, I still remember the first time I took insulin it was just like, oh, that was the problem. You know, that's what I need because my blood sugars just came down to right where they should be. So, you know, it was a little disheartening knowing that I was going to have to go on insulin. But at the same time, that relief of knowing that now here's the drug that works was yeah. it balanced it out. Do you remember I've been told this by other adults that I've talked to that what that first dose of insulin feels like? Do you remember that? I do remember I was staying at my mom's house. I was living alone at the time, and I thought, I don't want to be alone when I take my first yeah. dose of insulin, just in case. And I remember it dropped my blood sugars a little lower. They were like maybe in the mid-60s. And I just remember, I, I didn't feel shaky, but I just remember feeling less. It's that feeling of a sugar rush, basically. You know, when your blood sugars are high, I, for me personally, I definitely feel a little agitated, a little edgy, you know, a little more, I don't know if hyper is the word, but just a little buzzier. And I just remember that feeling going away. And I remember also being so terrified of like having to give myself an injection, like having to give myself a shot. And I was incredibly amazed at how easy it was and how painless it was. I had always imagined that it would just be a torturous experience, you know, mostly because your experience with injections is like vaccinations or inoculations, you know, it's or a flu shot. It's a very different experience. Yeah. Just give yourself a shot of insulin. And I remember feeling that relief also of, oh, I can do this. Okay, this is something that I can do. Wow. That's yeah. great. So the article that I, I'd mentioned, you start out by talking about this high spot in your career, the National Book Award in 2017, yes. <laughs> and then the reality of being an adult with type one, which is going to the bathroom, hiking up your formal gown, you know, yep. giving an injection. <laughs> and, you know, it's certainly a great way to start the article. But I'm curious, do you share your diabetes experiences with your friends and family? I mean, not everybody has to be giving themselves injections at the table, right? I know I'm sure you're not hiding things. I don't mean to imply that. Oh, but as a, as a yeah. mom, that was the first thing I thought of was, oh, my goodness, in the bathroom, is she OK? You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I obviously all of my friends and family know about it. I'm not someone who would ever conceal that part of me. It's not something that I ever feel ashamed of or feel like I need to keep secret. That's certainly not it at all. I think. For me, it's more about I'm very conscientious of other people's reactions to blood and to syringes or needles. 
And I just don't want to ever make someone, I definitely have known people and I've heard of people who just give them themselves an injection right at the table, you know, or will check their blood sugar under the table. And for me, I'm just not comfortable with that just in terms of making other people uncomfortable, but also sometimes things go wrong, you know, like sometimes, you know, there's a little bit more blood than you thought there would be, or you hit a blood vessel when you're injecting yourself with insulin. And, you know, sometimes it's just easier to be in, even if it's a public restroom, you know, it's still a confined space. And sometimes just the privacy to sort it out is something that I prefer. But in terms of being open, I definitely, I talk about it. Um, I do a lot of school visits with my job, you know, writing for young adults and right. young people. I do a lot of school visits and I always talk about how I was diagnosed and how that changed the trajectory of my life. And I always say to kids who here knows somebody with diabetes and almost every kid raises their hand, you know, yeah. Whether it's type one or type two, it doesn't really matter to me. I just, I know that they can make a connection with what I'm saying and relate it to either themselves or someone that they love in their lives. No doubt. Yeah. I think that too is the difference between my, my personal experience of type one diabetes is my 15 year old who has made a career out of trying to gross out his friends. Yeah. You know, <laughs> since the third grade. Watch this. So yeah. Slightly different experience than a grown woman in a formal dress. That dress, you know, it's expensive. You just yeah. really don't want to get anything on it. So. <laughs> so let's talk about the Babysitter's Club. Now, I'm a little bit older, so my guilty reading pleasure as a kid was more Sweet Valley High than Babysitter's Club. Also same. Yeah, also okay, same okay. Place, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> but were you a fan of this as a kid? This was something that you read and, and you, you looked forward to. Oh, I cannot even describe to you like <laughs> how much I loved the Babysitter's Club. Like, I can just remember going to my local bookstore, you know, the Walden books that was yep. in the mall at the time when there were still Walden books in malls and scanning the shelf and just looking for the new one and either being so excited when there was a new one or so disappointed when, you know, they came out every month and, you know, on day 30, I'd be like, where is the next one, you know, and sharing with your friends or your friend got the new super special. So then they would loan it to you and super specials were incredible. But yes, I mean, just. When I think about the Babysitter's Club, because I've also talked a lot about, you know, what is sort of my formative reading now as a writer, like what did I read as a child and a young adult that sort of made me a writer? I think the two things about the Babysitter's Club is that they were so funny. And I think I learned how to write humor and really good dialogue from those books. I think you can't really teach how to write humor or write something funny. But I think if you can see it, you can see how either rapid fire dialogue or really smart responses or interrupting each other like that was formative for me as a writer was seeing how they did that. And then also just as like a 11, 12, 13 year old girl, you know, that is where, and I'm sure a lot of women and girls have had this experience, your friendships just kind of implode. And nobody really knows why, but suddenly your best friend in sixth grade is your biggest enemy in seventh grade. And the factions are changing all the time. And who's friends with who and who's not friends with who and who did what to who. It's traumatic. It's a really difficult experience. It's a big part of growing up, but it's still difficult. And the thing with the Babysitter's Club was that at the end of the book, they were always friends. So you could see the sort of regeneration of friendship again and again and again. And for me, it was very comforting, you know, when sort of my female friendships were in turmoil. It was so lovely to see these girls work through things and stay friends in the end. So those were, I think, the two things that kept me coming back to the book. What a great way to look at it. Yeah. But you as a reader... Your type one experience was with your dad. So I imagine Stacy McGill, the character in the book who has type one, wasn't somebody you could really relate to. That wasn't why you were reading the books at the time. Absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. You know, I actually I shied away from Stacy as a reader. You know, I loved I moved to New York when I was 18 years old. I've always wanted to live in New York. So reading her as a 12 year old, I was like, oh, that's she's the sophisticated city girl. You know, that's how they always portrayed her. She's from New York City. But that was my favorite part of her. But there were books where either she was just diagnosed or I think there's a book later in the series where she was hospitalized. And I had a hard time reading those just because at the time, my dad's health, he had been a diabetic for 30 years at that point. So his health had gone up and down, you know, just the nature of the disease and the nature of treatment at the time as well. It wasn't as advanced as what we have now. So, you know, it was scary to see my dad go through that. And I Babysitter's Club was my safe place. You know, that was my fun, safe, circular path of Stony Brook, Connecticut. I didn't want a hospital or an insulin shot coming into it. So I don't say I didn't like Stacy as a character. I love Stacy as a character, but 
in terms of what she went through, I just, I really shied away from that. That wasn't, I was much more a Claudia Dawn girl. So (laughs) yeah. How did you approach the Netflix series? You've lived with type one now for a while. We all know that they never get it right in in media. I, I really looked looked at this show. I looked very much forward to it, but a lot of trepidation. I was almost afraid to watch it. What was your reaction? I I mean, I literally had an alert set on Netflix to remind me that the Babysitter's Club will be on Friday, July 3rd. And then I got the notification. I was so excited for it just because I had loved the books. And, you know, I don't know any of the creators personally, but I was familiar with their work and their backgrounds. And I had read a lot of articles by that point about how they had approached the material. And I just had a really good feeling about it. You know, I just thought that this is possibly in really good hands. And honestly, I wasn't even thinking about it in terms of Stacy and diabetes. I was thinking about it as, oh, my gosh, I'm now uh, something that I was a fan of for so long. I can now watch on my wow. television. You know, I wasn't even thinking about Stacy. So when I did start to watch it, I mean, I thought it was nearly perfect. I thought that they kept the spirit. I love that they kept the girls young. You do feel like you're watching 12 and 13 year old girls be 12 and 13 year old girls, you know, and all of the struggles that go into that, but all of their, I don't want to say immaturity, but just that feeling of they're still young. They're still figuring things out. They're not 17 years old in high school. You know, they're still little girls. And I thought that was really important to what the books were and to the show. And I just thought the way they modernized the material was perfect. You know, they talk about Claudia's grandmother being in Manzanar, you know, Claudia is Japanese American and talk about her grandmother being in Manzanar when she was young. And, you know, at one point, Marianne is babysitting for a kid who's transgender. And that would have never been in the books 30 years ago. And I just thought they did a beautiful job of modernizing not only the characters, but the storylines while still staying true to what the spirit of the books was. They did a nice job with that, too. And they did this many times where they would put something in like that you know, the child who was transgendered. But the storyline wasn't so much about that child. It was the babysitter character's reaction to it and reflection of it that I thought was, I'm going to throw this word out. I really thought it was masterfully done because she learned more about her. And yes, there was a there was a lesson there. And, you know, I know there's a lot of criticism from people who get uncomfortable with those kinds of issues, but I thought it was so well done. And they did that many, many times over. And my 18 year old, who's really conscious of those things right now, Mm -hmm. was really impressed. I thought it was really well done. But I was very worried about the truth about Stacy. I was like, oh, no, (laughs) because we see this happen so many times in media. And I think they got a couple of things that adults would notice kind of wrong. But boy, did they hit it out of the park in terms of what younger people would see. And what did you see? In Stacy, what I see in myself, here is a girl who is many, many things. And one of those things is diabetic. It is not the arc of her life. It is not the big picture of who she is. It's one thing. And there's a scene where she goes to babysit and her blood sugar feels a little bit low and she pulls out a juice box. And I realized that I had never seen that in media before. You know, I hadn't seen this girl or any girl or any woman just do that. She feels better. She keeps going. I mean, I have had literally hundreds of juice boxes on the road, (laughs) working, traveling, you know, so many, so many juice boxes gulped down in bathroom stalls and downstairs bathrooms. And, you know, just you you do what you have to do. That's important. And then your blood sugars come back up and you move on. And I was shocked at how blown away I was by that because it's such a simple act, but it is such a big part of managing your blood sugar and managing diabetes. Yeah. Didn't you expect her not to do that and faint? Yes. Or have to go home from yep. the babysitting job. That's that's what I think I, we all expected her to do. It was such a nice, normal, no, I'm fine. Yeah. And I also, I did like, there is a scene, I think, at the end where it's sort of like a neighborhood meeting with all the parents of the kids that they watch. And the, the girls are explaining what it what this means for Stacy and how this works. And I liked that they introduced the doubt of the parents because yeah. I think that's, it's a pushback that you get. Like, I are you okay? Can you handle this? You know, there's this feeling of, are you just going to collapse at any moment? Are you safe? And I like that they were like, this is how we, this is how Stacy manages it. This is how she handles it. Like these are factors in her daily life, but she's also smart enough and mature enough and knowledgeable enough to take care of herself. And I thought that that was a really good message as well to see that some people may not understand it. And here we are explaining to you what this is. You'll laugh. We had had that exact discussion, not as a group of parents, because we aren't lucky enough to have a babysitter's club in my neighborhood. (laughs) But one of our babysitters, when my children were younger, has type one. 
And when Lorian would come over, we the first couple of times we talked about, well, what would happen if you had a low blood sugar? And what would happen if this happens? And we talked about all of that. And it was funny. I saw a few adults in the community commenting on the show and they said that would never happen. Parents wouldn't talk about it that way. And then they also and I said, yes, well, I'm sorry, but we did. Yeah. And then the mother's overreaction. Right. No mother oh. would overreact like that. And I was like, hello, I my my son's very first low blood sugar when it was a, a bad enough low sugar that we had to treat you know, with more than just a juice box. We were about three weeks in. I called my endocrinologist convinced he was going to send us to the ER. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. OK, we treated it. His blood sugar is coming up. What do we do now? They were like, what do you mean? You did <laughs> you know, but yeah. I thought we were going to go in for tests or something. <laughs> so that kind of confusion really made me laugh because in the show, she actually did wind up going to the hospital for the day. But yes. in our yeah. experience, I mean, I did call. I can't say that I didn't. So it was pretty funny to see our real life reflected in that way. I did also like the mom's turnaround by the end. But it was more, as we mentioned earlier, it was more about Stacy and less about the other character. She turned it around. Well, going back to the mom, you know, I was diagnosed at 26. Yeah. I know how much my mom still worries about me to this day. Like she would never say that, you know, she would never say that explicitly. And I'm sure the way you worry about your children and your son, you know, that's just always going to be the worry. I think that's also very much based on who Stacy's mom and her parents were in the books as well. They were very anxious about her disease. And I think that was really important to see that, you know, Stacy is managing many different facets of this disease, including what is other people's reaction to it, including what is her, what are her parents' reactions to her and to it. And I like that they were able to have that conversation and the confusion between this is who I am versus this is how you're making me feel. I mean, I think those are things that every young person feels, even if they're not dealing with a chronic disease or not diabetic. How are you reacting to me versus how I want you to react to me? So I thought they did a really good job with that. But it's just tricky because every person you meet is going to react completely differently sure. to your diagnosis and regardless of how you react to it. And so that's another thing that you're always navigating is, I mean, I'm sure your son has heard this. I'm sure every diabetic has heard this, but we all hear the, oh, yeah, my uncle had it yeah. and he lost a leg or he now he's blind. You know, everyone right, will right. tell you oh. these tragic stories and you have to sort of put up a barrier and remind yourself, OK, well, that's not me. That is your uncle or your dad or whoever. So I think that was for me, a diabetic, seeing Stacy navigate the reactions of other people, I thought was really important as well, because that is a big part of it. You know, Robin, while I have you, and as you listen, Robin is a National Book Award winner, New York Times bestselling author, six novels for young adults. I want to ask you, Robin, why is it so hard to write genuinely for young people? I think for me, you know, six books in now at this point is empathy. It's the very mm-hmm. first thing that it has to be the the biggest part of every book is empathy. I think it's very easy to like see young people today and be like, you kids with your Tic Tacs and your Snip Snaps, you know, like they don't, you know, people, it's very, very easy to look at what is this? What are we in now? Generation Z, I guess. And look at them and think, well, in my day, we had this and not that. And we weren't on our phones all day. I mean, I'm on my phone all day. I'm a 43 year old woman. So I don't, you know, I'm not going to judge a 15 year old for being on their phone all day. But I think for me, the biggest thing is empathy because nothing really changes, right? Like we're all still figuring out how to get along with our friends. Who do we want to be? How do we get along with our parents? How do we move through the world? You know, I, as you get older, you hope you get wiser. You hope you have more experience that makes you grow mentally. You hope that you maybe have a little bit more agency and a little bit more ability to vocalize how you feel and how to stand up for yourself. But the struggles are still the same. You know, the way you get along with your teacher is the kind of the same way we all get along with a boss or sometimes in a classroom, you have to be with people you don't really want to be with. It's the same as in an office space. You know, sometimes you have coworkers. So I think the feelings are always the same. The technology doesn't matter. The place doesn't really matter. For me, it's just the feelings, whether it's love or family or friendships. Have you ever considered putting type one into one of your books? Yes, I have. I've definitely over the years, I've had conversations with different editors or people in publishing, and they've said like, hey, you're diabetic. Would you ever think about writing a book about diabetes? I think the thing is for me, and this is something that I've really, really, it's why I don't speak publicly about being a diabetic so much, is that I don't want it to become the only thing that people think of when they think of me. Again, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm very open with it. But at the same time, you don't want to just become, oh, that's Robin. She's the diabetic. You know, we, we are all more than just one thing. And so I 
know that if I do a book about being a diabetic or a character who has diabetes, I will have to talk about that book for years, you know, hopefully years, you know, one to two years, <laughs> you know, it will become the defining part of every interview that I do, every, you know, work conversation that I have. And I worry sometimes that it will dilute down to just me being a diabetic when I, like I said, I am so many other things as are pretty much every other diabetic out there. We are more than just that disease. And so I do think about it. Also for me, fiction is such a wonderful escape. I don't write books because I have to. I write because I love writing books, especially for young people. And I think that for me, I love that escapism of it. I love that I am not having to figure out a character's blood sugar situation when I'm already, <laughs> I've got enough doing that for myself. So I don't know. I think about it maybe as the years go by, maybe in a few years, I'll engage it. Um, it would have to be a really good idea. It wouldn't just be, oh, this character has been diagnosed with diabetes. There would have to be more at play for me. So, sure. so I think about it. Never say never, but if someone else wants to do it, go for it. You know, it's it's funny. I don't want to put too fine a, a point on it, but the first part of your answer there, which is you didn't want to be defined by diabetes, is really what Stacy's story is all about, too. Yes. And I think that's why we like it so much, because that's how almost everybody I know with any kind of diabetes feels. Yes. Right. Agreed. I think anybody with anything yeah. like that, you know, it's very easy, especially in sort of these wild modern times to focus on maybe what is unknown or scary or you know, maybe if people don't understand it, that's what they kind of go to first. But that's just not how I view it. And that's not how I view being a diabetic. It's just so it's just a thread that's woven into my life. You know, it, I it will always be there. It's something I will always manage. But it's so inherent to me. I don't want someone just to pull that thread out and only look at that rather than the bigger picture. Is there any depiction of type one in media that just makes you mad? Like, can you think of something where you're like, oh, I hate that one? When people refer to that one, I can definitely think of one thing, but I can't say it, <laughs> <laughs> okay. but I, it was fairly recent and yeah, it just, for me, it was sort of like that thing where you're just like, are you serious? Like, is this really like, this is what you had to do and this is what you did with it. And it just, it was petty on my part and, you know, <laughs> mean, and I can't say it, but I got so frustrated and so annoyed. And, you know, I think, that was a long simmering feeling that once I got to the depiction of Stacy, I think those two feelings just sort of combined and became the article, which was, I can't believe I just had to read this versus, oh, I can't believe I just saw this, you know, and the, the negative and the positive of that sort of combined together. But yes, definitely. <laughs> and then Babysitter's Club has got to have a season two. You know, is there anything that you remember reading that you'd really like them to see? And it doesn't have to be about Stacy. Oh, gosh. I really want to see Don's mom and Marianne's dad get together. Like I know they were together in the first season, but I, if memory serves, they get married. So I really want to see that wedding just because I love Don's mom, both in the book and on the show. And I love the way that they've treated Marianne's yeah. dad. It was funny. This is kind of sad, but in the opening scenes, Louie, the collie, you know, appears with Christy. It's Christy's dog, Louie, who's that collie dog. And I was like, Oh no. Louis, because I don't, if memory serves, things get a little dicey for oh, Louis. Oh, no. The I, end. Sorry. Spoiler. <laughs> spoiler alert. Sorry, Louis. Oh. But I, when I saw Louis, I was like, Louis, you know. <laughs> it is amazing what sticks with us from what we read in our childhood, right? Yes. Oh. Well, I was talking with a friend of mine about this. You don't realize how much you buried in your brain, you know. I'm watching the show and I'm like, oh, my God, it's Louis. Oh, my gosh, it's Morbid of Destiny. I forgot about Morbid of Destiny. And just Charlotte Johansson, Jamie Newton and his sister Lucy. And I'm like, how do I remember all of this? And yet I'm like, did I pay that bill? Did I remember? <laughs> See, now did I'm jealous. Have... I want to. I need a Netflix <laughs> Sweet Valley High so oh I can God, go back sure. and revel in those memories. I'm sure it's developing somewhere. Yeah, but... I, I kind of hope not. It was, yeah. really, it was really cheesy. <laughs> can I ask you, are you working on anything new right now? I, I know authors always hate that, but... <laughs> I know you just finished and oh, that was great. But what's that? I always say it takes a brave person to ask a writer. So what are you working on? Because, <laughs> <laughs> oh, tread carefully. Um, I am working on something. Yes, it has been a, I don't want to say a slow road, but the book has evolved many, many times. And I've sort of distilled down to what the book actually is. And I have started writing it. I feel really good about it. I started it a couple times, didn't feel good. Went back to the drawing board, ripped it all up again and started over. So I do feel good about it now. It has taken me a long time to figure out what it's about. And I think at the same time, I was coming down off the success of Far From the Tree and 
the time that that took, which was wonderful, no complaints, but it was hard for me to both work on a new book and enjoy the success of Bark from the Tree. So I am basically staying with family for a few months. I'm sort of quarantined away here. And just every day I sit down and write a thousand words and it's going well. It feels very, very good to be writing again. I haven't written for a while and I have missed it very much. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I look forward to reading that. I'm so glad that I read the article that was in L. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about this. It was a lot of fun and I continue to learn more about the Babysitter's Club. Maybe I should go back and read those books. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Call me if you have any questions about the Babysitter's Club. <laughs> you got it, Robin. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. More information on Robin and her books on the episode homepage. I'm really appreciative that she jumped on with me, and I'm definitely going to seek out her books now. It was funny to think about not just the Babysitter's Club books, which, as I said, I was marginally familiar with as a kid. I was a little too old. But those Sweet Valley High books, man, she made me want to see if my mother still has them. I bet she does. I guarantee you they do not hold up. Boy, were they a relic of their time, right? The 80s. (laughs) If you're familiar with Sweet Valley High, I know you know what I'm talking about. If you are not, I will not subject you to any more of an explanation. All right. In just a moment, uh, we'll be talking to a different kind of book altogether, a different kind of author, a dad who wrote a book about his son's diagnosis to help other kids and families. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. Do you know about Dexcom Clarity? It is their diabetes management software. And for a long time, I just thought it was something our endo used. But you can use it on both the desktop or as an app on your phone. And it's an easy way to keep track of the big picture. I check it about once a week. It really helps me and Benny dial back and see longer term trends and helps us not to overreact to what happened for just one day or even just one hour. The overlay reports help put context to Benny's glucose levels and patterns. And you can share the reports with your care team. We've done that all this year with the virtual appointments makes it so much easier and productive. Managing diabetes is not easy, but I feel like we have one of the very best CGM systems working for us. Find out more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. If you have a child diagnosed very young with type 1 diabetes, chances are you have a favorite book about diabetes that you read together. We were so lucky to have a couple of these. Rufus Comes Home was one from JDRF. There was another one that I've mentioned before called Jackie's Got Game that we absolutely adored. There are a lot of wonderful books now for kids with type 1. And this week, I am talking to one of the authors of these books, and that is Mike Suarez. He wrote Year One with Type 1 for and featuring his son, Andrew. It's all about their diagnosis story and also a bit of a teaching tool. Here's my conversation with Mike. Mike, thanks so much for joining me. It's great to talk to you. Hi, Stacy. Thanks for having me on. One of the things I loved doing when my son was diagnosed was finding books that we could read together. And, you know, my son was tiny. He wasn't yet two. And so when you have a picture book like this, it's really a a nice opportunity to go through it with the kids. So I I just want to let you know that I really appreciate what you've done here. I think it's great. Uh, Yeah, thanks for saying that. Um, You know, it was kind of the same experience I had. You know, I went to Amazon when he first got diagnosed and was looking for books myself. And I found some pretty good ones out there. But I was, uh, you know, really looking for one that really kind of resonated and, and, and something that I could share with my own uh, family members and friends to really kind of drive home what it is that he goes through and what it's all about. Wow. Well, it's been a couple of years now since Andrew was diagnosed. But why don't you take us through, even though you talk about it in the book, why don't you take us through his diagnosis story? Had you all had any experience with type one? Had you ever given an injection before and this? So I was unfamiliar entirely with type one diabetes. My wife was more aware of it because she had friends growing up and in college that had type 1 diabetes and she was around people that had given themselves insulin injections. And for me, I was just totally unaware of this condition. I was totally aware of of the treatment for it. The only thing I knew of diabetes was unfortunately just that joke that people like to tell around how if you eat too much candy, you get diabetes. And that's basically all I knew of, of diabetes, which obviously isn't true or isn't fair and especially isn't, isn't true of uh, type 1 diabetes. So I learned a ton uh, just in that, that first uh, few days in the hospital. When did it occur to you that with everything else that's going on, it would be a good idea to write a book? So it, it was probably a, a couple months shy of his uh, first year with it. I don't know how the idea popped into my head. I was taking the train in and out of Boston every day for work. And I think just a few lines kind of popped into my head. So I took out my 
iPhone and just wrote them in my notes app. Um, and I think part of it, too, was that my wife and I were talking about bringing a book into school to read to his classmates, uh, know what it is that he has and goes through and know why it is that he has to leave and uh, see the nurse and why it is he gets, you know, skittles every once in a while when he's in class. And, you know, going through the, the books out there, you know, again, there were good ones, but I was just looking for the right one that told the story I wanted to tell his classmates in the way that I wanted to. You know, I've seen that a lot of the other books out there are, are actually self-published. So I knew that the opportunity to do this was out there. You just had to kind of sit down and figure it out. So I, I utilized my uh, train time in and out of Boston to kind of write and refine my lines and, and kind of do a little bit of research to figure out what the process was all about. Was the idea for you to write it for kids to read or for parents to read? I mean, it, it's the kind of book writes in rhyme, but there are some concepts in there that are going to be above a four-year-old's head. Right. I think what I wanted most of all, well, I guess there were, there were a few goals. There were a few readers I had in mind. One was the newly diagnosed. I wanted for newly diagnosed children to be able to read this and be able to uh, relate to Andrew's story and be comforted to know that they're not alone in this, that there's other people um, that have been through this and have dealt with it. So that was maybe my primary audience. Secondary to that would be kind of the friends and family of somebody who was newly diagnosed, um, including my own friends and family, so that they can get an appreciation for what it is and kind of understand what it is that their, you know, diabetic friend or family member goes through. But I guess, you know, I, I was just thinking about when I read to my own kids, you know, a lot of time it's me reading to them, not them. I guess as they get older, it's more of them reading to themselves, but it's mostly me reading to them so I can, you know, kind of pronounce the big words, but also the books that we tend to enjoy the most or that I enjoy reading the most and they seem to be uh, the most receptive to are the ones that rhyme. So I did want to have that kind of make it accessible for kids, not make it kind of a, a chore to read. Um, and that's something that I, none of the other books that I saw did was, was kind of write in verse. So um, I wanted to have that aspect of it to be accessible. Similarly with the pictures and the drawings, I wanted them to be kind of, you know, lighthearted in a way as much as it's a serious subject matter, but to make it accessible for kids to understand. The book tells the story of, you know, your family's journey and then educating people about the basics of type 1 diabetes. But at the very end, your son has signed it and says, yes. you know, thank you. How did that piece come about? One thing I, I haven't mentioned yet is I actually did this whole thing in secret because I did it on my train ride so nobody was watching me. And then at night, I would, you know, once everybody went to bed, I'd maybe work on it a little bit more. And this includes the whole process, finding the illustrations, kind of framing it for them, getting beta readers to help sharpen up the, the rhyme and all that sort of thing. And um, I wanted this kind of personal touch because I, I wanted people to read it and realize that this wasn't a fictional character, that this is a real boy. There was maybe the same day that I asked Andrew to write up a birthday card for a birthday party he was going to. I just took out another piece of paper and just asked him to write on it. Thank you for reading. Love, Andrew. And he <laughs> asked me, what's this for? And I just was like, ah, don't worry about it. Like, I didn't really. <laughs> I just asked him to do it. Then I put it all together. And then I when it was finally done, I got to read it to my family for the first time. You know, naturally, they all, they all loved it. But I think it was I read it first to my wife and son while uh, my daughter was uh, napping because I didn't I kind of wanted to you know have their full attention. But after she woke up, Andrew uh, took the book and he showed it to her and he flipped immediately to that page that had his writing on it and was like so proud of uh, having that contribution to the book. Um, that was the first thing he showed his little sister. That's great. There's a page of the book that, you know, has him coming home and has gifts and things with a lot of names on tags. Are those friends and family names? Yep. They were basically, you know, the, the people that probably were the first to find out and, you know, felt, you know, really bad and, and uh, came to us with, with just some gifts for Andrew, including um, our next door neighbors and their kids my sister and her husband and their kids, basically, you know, aunts, uncles, siblings. And it just so happened that some of the names rhymed. So because um, <laughs> if you read them in order, uh, even the, the name tags uh, kind of, you know, rhyme together. When I recognized uh, that, I was like, you know, I should put them all in there and kind of, you know, thank, you know, some of the people that were, you know, part of this journey and, and, and a part of kind of coping with all of this. Yeah, I think it's really well done. The one thing I would say 
is there's this little bit about no sneaking snacks. We count carbs to know what goes into my body, but no sneaking snacks. That's beyond being naughty. Yep. I'm no psychologist, but I always felt like sneaking and and associating any bad behavior with diabetes uh-huh. was something that maybe it was something that we never did. Let's just put right. it that way. In my house, we always said you can't get in trouble for anything to do with diabetes. It just right. was off the books. So that's the only thing that kind of made my eyebrows go up a little bit. But gosh, uh, Mike, I'm not, you know, I'm really not a book <laughs> critic here. Sure. You sure. know, and I think it's also a good illustration, no pun intended, that we all parent in different ways. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's no one size fits all. You got to put insulin in. You got to know where your blood sugar is. Yeah. But, you know, the way you parent is probably not exactly the way I parent. And that's fine. Right. So that I was just curious. Um, And, you know, you showed it to your endo. I think that's, again, with my book, I did the same thing, right? You know, you, you're not a medical professional, but you're showing it to the medical professionals and, and hoping that they will flag anything that comes up. I'm also curious to know, your daughter makes a couple of appearances in the book, and she's one of those names that we mentioned. How is she doing? And how do you balance the son who gets all this attention for type one? And trust me, I have the same situation in my family, right? I have an older daughter who doesn't have type one. How do you handle that with her? How is she doing? Yeah, I mean, she's just as used to it by now as as Andrew. You know, Andrew was four and a half. She was one and a half. So she has no memory. You know, whereas Andrew may may recall, he's he's a he's got a pretty good memory for for a kid his age. He may recall a time before all of this. She would have absolutely no memory. So this is all she's ever kind of grown up to know. So whereas if they were teenagers, um, then maybe if she was used to just you know snacking whenever she wanted, she would continue to do that despite Andrew's diagnosis. But because we're able to kind of be careful around that about that stuff from the outset, if it's not time for Andrew to eat, then we're not going to let her eat in front of him. But if we're, you know, giving Andrew, you know, something to bring his blood sugar up, if it's maybe a pack of Smarties or something like that, and we only need to give him eight of the 10, then maybe we'll give her the other two. But it is interesting to see how she internalizes it as she gets older, how she responds to it. Somewhat funny side note around it is, she sees Andrew take shots all the time and she doesn't get them herself. And sometimes she sees Andrew get shots and she like asks or she at least she at least did this uh, yeah. uh, earlier on. She would say, where's Maggie's shot? Where's Maggie's shot? And we would explain, no, Maggie doesn't need a shot. So I think it was last year when we took her to get her flu shot. She was all about getting her flu shot. Right, no doubt. It. After she got it, she asked for another one no. and she was like – crying because not because she got the shot, but because she only got one, which was kind of backwards from what you'd expect a, a kid her age uh, to do. And then another kind of similar story is uh, there was one day where she uh, closed like a, a dresser draw on her finger and her fingernail started bleeding. And you would expect a kid her age to just start wailing. Uh, she actually picked up her finger and she was like, check my blood sugar, check right. my blood sugar. You also wrote a Christmas story. Yep. <laughs> about diabetes. Why did that come about? Tell me that story. Yeah, sure. So when year one with type one first came out, yeah, I created a Facebook page to kind of co- go along with it to give updates about Andrew and to kind of, you know, create some fun memes and things like that to kind of draw attention to it. And um, I created a kind of a spin on Twas the Night Before Christmas. And every once in a while, like a new couple lines would occur to me even after Christmas. And I would kind of go back and edit the post. And then at, at some point I was like, you know, there's probably enough here and there's probably enough opportunity for reuse from my first book that, you know, it wouldn't even be that many more new illustrations. I could just turn this into uh, another book uh, relatively inexpensively and, you know, certainly justify the cost that goes into it. And so I said, yeah, why not? So I, I just kind of thought through it and just kind of threw it together. And I was really happy with the way it came out. So, Mike, we celebrate Hanukkah. I'm not sure how well versed I am in this classic poem. Right. But it seems to me that all of the reindeer have Dexcom sensors <laughs> on. I'm not sure I remember that from the original. Am I looking at this right? Do they all have Dexcoms on? Uh, everybody. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> basically everybody in the story. The, the, Dex, the, the reindeer have all, uh, all have Dexcom on. The, uh, the elf on the shelf has one. Uh, Santa has one. Basically everybody in the, in the book. And that's uh, – <laughs> What I wanted to create was kind of a, a world where, you know what, it's okay that everybody in the story has it. 
All right. So what's next? Will there be another issue of this? Uh, are you going to move on to the elementary school age as Andrew you know, is seven now? So it's a little different than when he was little. Yeah, it's a good question. I'd certainly like to do, you know, to continue Andrew's story. Um, I haven't really started anything yet, but I've got a few ideas floating around. I mean, I, I think one of the things I realize is that there's actually more children's books that are picture books than there are kind of chapter books. That's obviously a whole different ball game than uh, picture books. But my mother-in-law is actually, uh, she, she's an author uh, um, as well, and she's written lots of novels. So if I do decide to go down that road, it'll probably be a lot more work than I did for these other ones. But I certainly would have, you know, a mentor throughout the process yeah. if I did go down that route. It'd be great to have more books with a protagonist who lives with type one and it's not about type one. If I could put a request in, yeah. you know, it would be really nice. There's a few books and I'll, as you listen, I'll, I'll link some of them, them up in the show notes, but there are a few books besides, you know, the babysitters club that features Stacy who lives with type one, but it's a little outdated at this point. And the, the Lily books, there are some, I hesitate to call them novels. They're like novelizations for middle schoolers and stuff like that, but it would be great. There's only a couple of books I can think of that have a, protagonist who lives with type one, but the book is really not about the diabetes. Right. So yeah, that's, I'll put my vote in for that. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I think that's a great idea. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you coming on. These books are so fun. I have a lot of great memories of reading the book that we liked when Benny was little. Jackie's Got Game was our favorite. I don't even know if they're still printing that one, but that was the one we loved. So I hope that people find this and love it, you know, kind of just like we did that story. So thanks for coming on and sharing your story. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. You can find out more about Mike's book. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the episode homepage. This is in the show notes. Every episode has show notes on whatever app you're listening to. If you listen to podcast apps, they all display a little bit differently. I think Spotify is finally letting people click through. In other words, if there's a link in the show notes, you can get there through Spotify. But you can always go to the homepage at diabetes-connections.com if, if things aren't showing up in your player and find out more there. A couple of years ago, I met a local woman here in the Charlotte, North Carolina area who lives with type 1 diabetes. Dana Cumberworth, the first impression uh, that she made on me was that this might be one of the fittest people I would ever meet. And come to find out, she is really just an athlete, just one of these people who is always, always moving and pushing and you know, thriving with type 1. She bikes, she runs, she weight trains. Dana was diagnosed as a student. She was a first-year student at Wake Forest in their physician's assistant program. And how she was diagnosed is pretty incredible because they were doing the endocrinology part of the class. And when her lab partner tested Dana's blood sugar, it came back at 700. So she was diagnosed in the class. Well, she was diagnosed at the doctor's office the next morning. Fast forward, uh, she has since done, I believe, three Ironman races, and then she started getting involved with JDRF and the bike rides. This year was to have been a very big deal for Dana because this is her 10-year anniversary. It was just last week, actually, that she marked 10 years with Type 1, and she was going to do several, if not all, of the rides this year. Oh, my goodness. But of course, plans changed. Everything went virtual. So she and her husband and friends planned to head out to the beach to the East Coast here of Charlotte, North Carolina, and do their own version of the ride there. This was supposed to happen this past week. But if you've been following the weather and the, the hurricane trackers, then you probably know that Hurricane Isaias was a big problem here in North Carolina. So instead of being able to complete this at the beach, in fact, with the way that podcasting time uh, shifts here, she will have completed 100 miles in Charlotte with some friends and family. So that is absolutely amazing. She set a new goal. She keeps surpassing her monetary goals. So her new goal set just a couple of days before that ride is $20,200 because, as she said in one of the videos she makes, you know, 2020 has already been unbelievable. So why not push that goal that way? She's not that far off. So $20,000, $20,200. And oh, I have forgotten to mention that Dana and her husband announced a couple of weeks ago that she is pregnant. I believe at this point, she's about 18, 19 weeks along. I am going to put some of her videos in the Facebook group because she's been you know, talking about her journey this whole year. And I just think her story is amazing. I will link up some of the videos that she's been doing into the Facebook group at Diabetes Connections, the group. But yeah, 100 miles, type 1 diabetes, pregnant. And when you look at her smile, 
It just looks like it's a piece of cake. She is so inspirational to me, especially to push on with everything that's happened this year and how this ride keeps getting changed and changed and changed. So congratulations, Dana. Continued good luck and good health to you and your family. And we will be cheering you on. If you have something good going on, it doesn't have to be 100 miles of biking while you're pregnant. Uh, it can be um, you know, a diversary, a milestone that makes you and your family happy or something that you really want to shout to the hills. Let me know. You can email me, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com or post in the Facebook group. Just tell me something good. At the top of the show, I said I was going to talk just a little bit more about The Babysitter's Club, the TV show on Netflix. And I think that Robin and I covered it pretty well. But I just wanted to say a couple of more quick things about the actual depiction that I realized we didn't touch on in the interview. If you haven't seen it, or even if you had, I'm curious what you think. The feedback I heard from my friends who have kids with type 1 who watched it was that, I don't know anybody who didn't like it, universally very well received by their kids. They loved seeing a beautiful young woman who was accepting of her condition, who told her mom, you know, I'm going to do it this way, who asked for a fancy purse. She didn't get the fancy purse, but, you know, she did ask for that Gucci bag and, you know, other things like that, which made it seem very normal. You know, she was low during babysitting. She drank the juice box and went on her way. It didn't seem insurmountable. And her friends, the kids, I don't think Robin and I talked about this, the other babysitters in the club, when they found out, said, oh, I know somebody with diabetes or you can still do such and so with that, right? okay, no problem. And they really just moved along like most kids do. It's the adults that have more of a problem. The things I didn't like about it, they still got stuff wrong, which amazed me because I know that they had to be consulting with people who have type one for this, or at least I hope they did. But what they got wrong was the seizure. Did you see that? She had a seizure before she was diagnosed and they talked about it like she went into insulin shock. Now, I am not a medical expert. Perhaps that could happen, but it makes no sense to me that somebody who is not yet diagnosed with type 1, so they are not taking any insulin, could go into an insulin shock that would make them have a seizure, right? It just seemed kind of of a stretch. They wanted to do something that would make Stacy embarrassed to push the reason why they moved. It was just this whole, I, I don't know, to me, that was a big turnoff, but it was quick and I get it. It moved the plot along. The other thing was this weirdness where that one low blood sugar, which Stacy treated herself, causes her mother to take her in for a day of tests. Now, having been a very worried mother, and I'm still one, let's face it, but when I called my endocrinologist every single day of the first month that Benny had type 1, which I really did do, they never told me, bring him in for tests because he had a low blood sugar, right? I could see a parent calling. I could see a parent being alarmed. I couldn't see an endocrinologist going along with that. And I mean, Stacy was talking about how she was in the hospital for a whole day taking tests. So that was also a little weird. Is it nitpicky? Yeah. But if you're going to tackle something like type 1, it's really not that hard to get it right. So I, I hope they continue to follow Stacy and show her confidence and show her doing lots of other things that have nothing to do with diabetes. There's definitely going to be a season two of this show. It's a huge hit. That means there's a lot of room to get it right. So I stay optimistic. What did you think? I'm really curious to hear what other people have to say about this as more people discover the series. Before I let you go, I have something to ask of you, and it is about podcast reviews. If you are still listening, I know you are a big fan. I would really appreciate it if you have a moment to go to whatever podcast player you're listening on and leave a review. Maybe you're listening on the website or through social media, but especially if you're on Apple Podcasts, I'd really appreciate a review there. If you're not, you can head over to Apple Podcasts, easily find Diabetes Connections and hit subscribe. It's free to subscribe, no cost. It is free on any podcast player and we are everywhere you can get audio, Spotify, Pandora, Apple, Google, Android. If you're not sure, go to the website, diabetes-connections.com, scroll down and you will see 15 links of places (laughs) to subscribe to the podcast and you just, you can pick one. Chances are good the app is already on your phone and subscribe for free and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. All right. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>